Today's reflection is from 2 Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Welcome to Webster's Webster Presbyterian Church. We are pleased that you are worshiping with us, whether by Zoom or in person. Announcements for today. Uh, the service guidelines are the same. If you are fully vaccinated, masks are optional. If you're not fully vaccinated, please wear your mask at all times in the church. All are welcome, no reservations needed. Our summer mission initiatives, we have two. We have the Bella's Bumbas and South Wedge food program. The envelopes are on the chair racks. And also, the, we are collecting the school supplies for needy children at Williamson and Eastern Service Workers. Collection bins are in the narthex and outside the entrances. We want to know your favorite hymn or phrase music. See the bulletin for how to submit your selection. And the session members, your next meeting will be via Zoom. Uh, please check your email for details. <laughs> And a joyful announcement today, this is Communion Sunday. Today the service will bring the communion elements to you. Please remain in your seats. They will use tongs to place the bread in your hand <coughs> and to point out, <coughs> excuse me, and to point out which cup you should take. After receiving the bread, please consume it and then take a cup, consume it and place the cup in the chair rack in front of you.
Let us unite in the call to worship. You call your people to prayer and praise in many ways. This day, bring us together just as you called the people of Israel to gather manna in the desert to eat and sustain life. God of unity, give us this day our daily bread. As spiritual beings, we desire to receive food that endures faith, hope, and love. All life is created and nourished by you. May we grow into new circles of understanding and being, reflecting the ways in which we have been touched by your holy manna. And the prayer of invocation, life sustainer. The next hymn is There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, it's number 298 in your hymnal. prayer of confession, let us unite in the prayer of confession. All together, God, we confess that we often spoon feed ourselves items and ideas that do not provide us the energy we need to do your work. This creates space between ourselves and each other and turns to the right form. The assurance of pardon. Through Jesus, we have been given an example of one who was truly nourished and sustained by God in Christ. We are forgiven, made whole, and restored to the one body.
Please remain standing for the passing of the peace. Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. This is a Psalm of David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let your bones, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The second reading is from John chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. This takes place just after Jesus had fed the multitude and walked down the water. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to, to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The next hymn is Bread of Heaven on Thee We Feed, number 501 in your book. 
I just think I'll take a moment right now and mention that um, while our, I've been vaccinated both times, but it's just simply as, a ma as an abundance of caution, uh, you see me walking around with this mask. Uh, but yeah, I, following the rules here, just following the rules. Um, our lesson this morning comes from um, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, and I'll read them for you now. They read, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each, is a, but each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown, aboard, blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness or in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And the people all said, Amen. Amen. Excuse me for just one second. The message of Ephesians is clear. The author says in verse one, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. This morning, I'd like to make an attempt to plumb the depths of a life worthy of our callings, a life worthy. I firstly want to acknowledge that most of what you will read about this passage 
says that it is about the unity of the church and the health of the church. Secondly, I want to acknowledge that much of what you will read about these 16 verses will also say that it points the way to understanding the ethical implications of life with Christ. I acknowledge those two points of interpretation as true, but I will barely touch upon what most interpreters think about this passage. Forgive me for not taking these, the road less traveled, but it seems worthwhile for us to principally consider a life worthy of our calling. I have a friend and we'll call him Steve. Steve spent some time in the ministry and one day he said to me over lunch, he was at the point in his life where he had come to wonder about and to consider his legacy. He wondered what he would leave behind. His children were given names uh, that honor this faith tradition. One bears the name of the biblical prophet Jeremiah and the other is named Christian. I know them as children and they are now fine young men. But my friend was not thinking in terms of his children as he was wondering about a legacy. While Steve did, it not, did not exactly say this, my friend was asking the question, have I lived a life worthy? Now, I know Steve well enough that I would give him a character reference of the highest order. In some circles, you would call him a stand-up guy, and I would say he is indeed the salt of the earth. But my friend wasn't concerned with what I would say about him. In a way, Steve was looking to be, to be greeted by Jesus with the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Steve, contemplating his legacy, once it said of him that he lived a life worthy. Now, maybe he had taken to heart and accepted as fact the words of a hymn that declares only what you do for Christ will last. Let me share with you three stanzas of this song. You may build great cathedrals, large and small. You can build skyscrapers, grand and tall. You may conquer all the failures of the past, but only what you do for Christ will last. You may seek earthly power and fame. The world might be impressed by your great name. Soon the glories of this life will be past, but only what you do for Christ will last. Though your armies may control each hemisphere and your orbits out in space cause men to cheer, your scientific knowledge may be vast, but only what you do for Christ will last. Written in 1963, this songwriter figured out that only what you do for Christ will last. To the church, in Ephesus, the scripture says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And adding in verse two, with all humility and greatness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Enlisting these character traits, humility, gentleness, and patience, and stating this way of being, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, we hear from this text a perspective on how to live a life worthy of our calling. But I use the word perspective because there are lots of perspectives on the Christian calling. Just a few weeks ago, I shared the history of how the Christian fundamentalist perspective came to have a hold on Western Christendom. In case you forgot, it was paid for. A lot of money went into the creation of what we call Christian fundamentalism. For me though, my perspective and my go-to position on how you serve God and live a life worthy of your calling is to turn to the commandments of God. Jesus, when asked what the greatest commandment is, said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. I believe you can navigate murky theological waters 
and arrive at the core values of the Lord with the question, is this love? And if you were looking at an issue and having a problem answering the question, is this love? You also ought to ask, does this cause suffering? My friend Steve, pondering his legacy and wondering about a life worthy, can ask himself the question, is this love? And again, if he is stumped on whether or not the result of his core values add up to love, he can ask himself if his core values cause suffering. A passage from the letter to the church at Rome comes to mind. Be not conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the redoing of your mind that you may live what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. A life worthy has discerned what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The 16 verses in our lesson cover a lot of ground, more than can reasonably covered in the time allotted. So allow me to wander around in this text a bit, then we can have prayer and go to the communion table and see what we might learn from Jesus as we eat with him. From the middle of verse 13, we read, become mature, says our lesson while attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. The Ephesians are getting the message of caution about those that would come to Ephesus with other teachings about God and other teachings about Jesus. People make a career telling others what they should think. There are over 200 Christian denominations in the United States. That means, <clears throat> excuse me, that means over 200 times people have disagreed on what this faith means. I've shared with you many times, many times, that my theology teacher James Cone said, you ought to teach your faith like people treat money. You got to hold your faith up to the light and look at it real good to make sure that what you're holding on to is not counterfeit. You don't want a counterfeit faith. You don't want a faith defined by a Washington lobbyist. With everything, Dr. Cohn pressed us, his students, to think free from and to think beyond cultural constraints. I'd like to think of myself as someone who can work with anybody who can honestly ask the question, is this love? Does this cause suffering? I'm gonna to hasten to a close right now by just simply telling you that God through Christ Jesus has set us up to be worthy of amazing grace. God through Jesus our Christ has set us up to be worthy of eternal life. And God through Jesus our Christ has set you up to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'll ask now that the church says amen. We continue now with our, uh, any, pr any prayer requests or prayer concerns or joys or concerns that we might share with one another. Okay, over here, who's gonna take the microphone over there to, we're working on a microphone. We have a microphone. We're what? Okay, we're working on uh, 
Do you want to? Okay, we, oh, here we go. Okay, Kathy's over there. Hmm? Okay, we have one. That, okay, go ahead. Okay, Bob Smith sends praise for his healing. You probably heard a week or so ago that uh, he was having some surgery for a um, pinched nerve, and he says it's been a success. Um, I've got two praises. First, that uh, Linda Haynes moved into assisted living, and for the first time since I've known her, she is going from activity to activity during the day, having a wonderful time meeting people, and it's just out and about. And she looks so much better. So praise God, because it's been a long time. Amen. Amen. And the second is that um, I will be going with half of my family. We're going to take a trip over to um, Salem just as a last vacation before my oldest granddaughter goes off to college. But it's just being together, which is, is a huge joy. Amen. Amen. This is a joy to say that I have been blessed to celebrate uh, 50 years of Amen. 50 years of living, and I just give God the glory for that. Uh, additionally, I have one of my mothers, you know, visiting. She came over to celebrate this event with me. She coming from Delaware, and her name is Margaret. So I give God the glory for that. Thank you. Amen. 50 years old, really. <laughs> okay. I also have a praise. I have been asking for prayers for my friend Phil um, ever since the end of March. He is home as of last week. Amen. Amen. I would wait until next week when it's all over, but I'm not, it's going to be a busy weekend, so I'm not sure I'm going to be here. But on uh, Friday, our oldest son, Noah, and his fiance, Tori Clark, who both used to be members here, will be getting married. Amen. 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 In St. Joseph, Missouri, Matthew and Miranda are getting married, too. Amen, 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 amen. Is, is that all? Is that it? Um, okay, so I'm going to do um, some marriage counseling right now to those newlyweds. No, 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 don't, don't laugh. I'm going to strongly encourage that they pick up a book called Getting the Love You Want. The author's name is Harville Hendricks. Okay, I'm gonna say that again uh, to those people that are gonna be newlyweds. The title of the book is called Getting the Love You Want. And the author's name is Harville Hendricks, okay? Got, everybody got that? You, you guys might wanna pick it up as well. But I'll say this, I'll say this. My big takeaway from the book was grace. That was my big takeaway from this book, was grace. Now, don't take that as the summary because it, you know, it provides a lot of valuable points leading up to that conclusion that it's all about grace. Um, but again, it's like my takeaway was grace. So, you know, maybe as a gift to your children and grandchildren, you can go find this book, Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks uh, and pass that, on, pass that on to them. Um, I'll be out of town for a couple of weeks or on and off uh, during um, this month of August uh, and the first week in, se in September. Um, but my understanding is that you've got some, uh, some great preachers coming to you, and in particular, 
um, uh, Dr. Gail Ricciuti, Reverend Dr. Gail Ricciuti. Um, Gail is, a, I call Gail a friend, and Gail um, is, reti is a retired preaching professor uh, at Colgate Rochester Divinity School. So you'll have at least one opportunity to see for a change somebody know, who really knows how to do this. Um, the, there was something else. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I make the point, I don't, I don't make it often enough that this preaching is also for me. You know, I need to hear this as, you know, just as much as you do. And this is a confession. Last week, um, you know, I, you know, gave a, uh, a, the sermon was about, you know, not being fearful and not being concerned. And then and right when I was done, I launched into my concern about my kids going to Chicago to this Lollapalooza festival. And it looked like a good idea when the city of Chicago decided to go ahead with it and when uh, their mom and a friend of hers decided that they would, uh, you know, go ahead and, you know, you know, travel from Rochester and Washington, D.C. and meet up with some friends from Indiana for this huge festival. And then it dawns on me, as well as just about everybody else, that's a super spreader. <laughs> that's a super spreader. One of the, you've heard the term super spreader with, with respect to, um, okay, but I tell that to you that to say that when, you know, because we're going to take off and go camping, um, It'll be two weeks between the time you, between today and uh, the next time you see me. So, <laughs> you know, so I will effectively be clear again. <laughs> you know, I will effectively be clear again. You know, but I, I you know, but in all seriousness, um, you know, let's keep in prayer and do what we can do for those who are dealing with, um, you know, this, you know, infectious disease. Let's, you know, <laughs> You know, we often pray, um, or at least I often will say a prayer that says, you know, thank you, God, for waking us up clothed in our right minds. And uh, some people's right mind is they don't need to get vaccinated. Um, I see that differently. Um, so let's pray for those who, um, you, know, can, you know, can use some help, um, you know, with, in terms of making decisions about, uh, the, you know, their health. Um, let, you know, let's keep them in mind. Um, and, you know, as an, out of an abundance of caution, the uh, session meeting tomorrow evening has been moved to Zoom out of, as an, you know, so if you're, you know, if you haven't gotten the email ch yet, check your email for the link and the details, um, you know, regarding that. Um, and that's about all I can think of right now. And uh, if you think of anything, you can shout it out right now. Ah, come on, you got lots on your minds. Let us pray. Gracious, eternal, and everlasting God, to you we say thank you. We stop now. We bow our heads, we humble our hearts, and we direct our minds and our spirits to you. Firstly, dear Lord, to say thank you. Thank you, dear God, that you are Lord of Lords and that you are King of Kings and that you are the last stop on every question we might have. Thank you, dear God, for being God all by yourself. Thank you, dear Lord, for the many ways in which you bless us. You have blessed us today to see another day. We have, you have blessed us, dear Lord, to see this day and to meet once again the air that you provide. You have blessed us once again, dear God, to meet up with the rain that you provide. You have blessed us, dear Lord, with blood pulsing warm through our bodies, carrying that air to the various parts of our body. 
It's you, dear God, bringing that air into our lungs. It's you, dear God, carrying that blood and that oxygen to our eyeballs and to our assorted organs. We know it's you, dear God, and we thank you as your spirit and as your love pulses through our bodies. If we had a million tongues, we could not adequately express all the ways in which you continue to bless us. You continue, dear God, to keep the moon at a safe distance from the earth. You continue, dear God, to keep the earth from plummeting into the sun. You're just blessing us in every which way. Through our family and the friends and loved ones, you, dear God, are blessing us. But even as we say thank you for all of these things, dear God, we thank you for the blessing that came to us through your son, Jesus the Christ. The one who came and walked among us and taught us how to live. The one who said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall find comfort. Blessed are those who mourn, blessed. You told us, dear God, you told us, Jesus, all the ways in which we are blessed. You told us that your yoke is easy and that your burden is light. You told us, you said to us, you invited us, come unto me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So yes, dear God, we thank you for your son, Jesus to Christ. But dear God, we would be liars if we came before you and said we had no concerns because it's surely, dear Lord, we have concerns. But we know what to do with these concerns. We bring them to you. We have concerns about our health. We have concerns about our loved ones. We have concerns, dear God, about our nation, about our weather, about all manner of earthly things we have concerns about. But dear God, we know that we need to bring those concerns to you. We know, dear God, that we need to trust you and that we know, dear God, that, and we are certain of your love for each and every one of us. So thank you, dear God. So whatever concerns we might have, we bring them to you and we can declare because of you that it is well with our souls. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake, we all pray together, amen. disciples approached the Lord Jesus and they said, Master, how shall we pray? And Jesus turned to his disciples and looked to them and said, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven. You know, at this point, um, you know, you know, you know. I want to remind you that uh, your gifts can be mailed into the office, um, and or you can uh, click the give button on the Presbyterian on the church's website. Um, and now uh, for the doxology. <laughs> Come bless these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and glory. Amen. Our worship continues now with the celebration of the service of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us the way of life. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity once again to come to this table. We thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity to eat with you. Um, and we thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to sit at this table and to learn from you once again. Bless this meal now, dear God, for the nourishment of our souls and to, for the, to the blessing of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake we say, Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God, and they will come from the north and south and the east and west and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast in this kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving and death of the risen Lord until he comes. With thanksgiving, let the people say, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Our closing hymn is, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love.
Now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you henceforth, now, and forevermore. And the people all said, Amen. Amen.